Good evening, everybody. Welcome to another um, Day to Be Cybar. Um, I'm, I'm not your normal uh, normal host, but uh, Sarah, our, our regular coordinator, who's having a few problems this evening. Um, so without further ado, um, let me hand over our speaker this evening, uh, Dr. Richard Waller from Keele University. And Richard's going to be talking to us this evening for roughly 45 minutes or so. Um, followed by a Q&A session uh, afterwards, if anybody has any questions you would like to ask. Uh, if you would like to ask questions at the end, um, feel free to unmute yourself or ask questions into the chat and we can relay them on your behalf. So Rich is going to talk to us this evening about transport futures, e-mobility and the decarbonisation of travel. So thank you, Richard. Um, really nice to be uh, to, nice, really nice to be uh, with you uh, this evening. Can you can you see my slides? OK. Yep, I can see them fine, thanks. Brilliant, no, that's that's great. So, um, so yeah, thanks very much for the invite. It's really nice to have you and uh, have an opportunity to, uh, to to talk to you this evening. And um, it, it's maybe a slightly different uh, background to, uh, to, 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 or a slightly different talk to that which I'm used to delivering. In terms of maybe the sort of opening images sort of encapsulates uh, my sort of my, my uh, sort of research interests, past, present and future. Uh, my sort of background over the last 20 years or so has been working really as a sort of like a glaciologist and a glacial geomorphologist. And uh, uh, so I've spent um, time in, in places like Iceland, um, Greenland, uh, the Canadian Arctic, looking at, uh, at glaciers and permafrost. And maybe that could be a topic for a, a future talk. Um, but you'll notice in this sort of image of, uh, of, a, of a glacier margin in Iceland, this, uh, this, this EV charger in the foreground. And I find myself um, about mid-stage in my career, having become interested in transportation, um, and in, 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 in particular, the, uh, the, 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 the electrification of transport uh, and the potential role that that can play in, in decarbonizing our, our, our travel. Um, so, advance these slides. So, yeah, the, in terms of the change in direction in that sense, this is me as a, uh, as a, as a so I think about a 12-year-old, and it's the first time I ever saw um, a glacier. Um, and that led to a sort of like an interest in terms of working in, in glaciers and, and permafrost environments. But my, my, my research interests um, of, of uh, I still have an interest in glacial and permafrost environments, but I've started to become interested, as I say, um, in transportation <coughs> and, and, and the, uh, the potential for, for electric vehicles in, uh, in, in particular and, and electrification of transport in general um, as a way of, uh, of, of decarbonizing this particular sector of our economy. Um, so what I'd like to do uh, this evening, I'll, I'll keep an eye on time, is to, uh, is, is to start off by putting it in the context. What's the issue here? What's the problem? Um, and in terms of looking at the, uh, the, the, you know, the major societal challenges related to uh, both atmospheric pollution um, and also the, uh, the, the carbon emissions associated with transport in a situation where we're looking at reducing carbon emissions as rapidly as possible. Um, then sort of like looking at electric vehicles as a possible solution. Um, looking at a brief history of electric vehicles, um, some of the common questions that you uh, that, that, that I get asked uh, and others who have EVs and, and, and looking at their potential uh, benefits. Of course, I'd be the first to recognize that no technology is a panacea. Um, so looking at the, the ongoing and indeed the emerging challenges related to uh, that transition to uh, electric vehicles in terms of their environmental impacts and the resource demands, but other things like um, the challenges related to making sure that's a, a just transition, uh, and then finish off by uh, looking um, forward to uh, to some of the uh, the, the, the more positive uh, future prospects. So, in terms of the problem, then um, I think the problem is sort of fairly clear in in in, uh, in one instance in relation to uh, you know the significant amounts of uh, of atmospheric pollution uh, that are associated with, uh, with 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 transport, variety of different types of transport. Um, and related to, uh, you know, for example, to combustion engine um, vehicles. And, you know, this is, of course, recognized in things like the United Nations Sustainable uh, Development Goals. And uh, in uh, the UNSDG 11, um, there's an estimate that as of 2016, 90% of urban dwellers uh, are breathing what's considered to be poor quality or unsafe air. Um, and, you know, there are, var there are uh, variations in terms of what the numbers are, but you know, pretty much all of the estimates suggest that you're talking about millions of, uh, of, of, of additional deaths associated with exposure to, uh, to ambient uh, air pollution, um, with transportation within urban areas making a significant contribution to that. 
Um, of course, this is something that we can end up looking at in relation to uh, the pollution that we find in, in cities in, in, in China uh, and India, for example, and other parts of the, uh, of the global south. Um, but of course, that's not something that we're immune to uh, within, the, within the UK. Um, and it was here in sort of 2016 uh, that this report by the Royal College of Physicians, they, they estimated in this report that there are approximately 40,000 deaths um, each year uh, that were attributable, attributable uh, to, uh, to, to exposure to, uh, to outdoor um, air pollution at the risk was greatest um, in areas uh, close to busy roads where you've got the greatest impact of, uh, of, of transport. Um, but the, the element um, I'd, I'd like to sort of focus on is obviously is the connection between transport and, and carbon emissions and, and something which I'm, I'm sure is, you know, we're very sort of conscious of um, with uh, the COP26 summit having taken place um, in, uh, in the UK last November. And, and it's estimated that the transport sector as a whole is responsible for the release of eight gigatons, eight billion tons a year uh, of carbon dioxide emissions, uh, which is roughly um, a quarter of the, uh, of the global total. Um, and about three quarters of those emissions relate to, uh, to, to road transport. And um, it's estimated that there are about 1.2 billion cars in operation uh, on our roads uh, around the world. And uh, this is increasing by about 100 million cars um, every year. Um, and so at a time when we are becoming increasingly aware of the need to reduce our carbon emissions and that the, uh, the, the emissions associated with transport have actually increased um, by around 70% between 1990 and 2016. So things heading in the wrong direction. Um, and if we end up looking at um, the, uh, the, the situation within the UK, you can see that we've made great strides uh, in terms of decarbonizing, uh, decarbonizing uh, the production of electrical energy. Our grid has, has decarbonized quite rapidly uh, since the uh, since the noughties. Um, but if, yeah, is that okay? Is there a, is there a problem with? Uh, can you hear me? Okay. Yeah, can you hear you fine? Oh, OK, cool. No, I just uh, I just heard my name being called. Um, fine. Now, in, in, so if we end up looking at um, transportation, then, well, if we look at the UK, then you know, we made great strides in terms of energy. But you can see that transport has basically sort of flatlined going back to the 1990s. We haven't really made any headway in decarbonizing transport to the point that if we look at the terrestrial carbon emissions uh, emitted within the UK, then that is transport, which is the uh, which is which is now the the dominant sector. Um, and again, if we end up looking at the, uh, the the progress or maybe the lack thereof over the course of the last uh, thirty years or so, um, you can see that the, uh, the the carbon emissions associated with uh, different modes of road transport haven't really diminished, and in some cases. Of course, you know, this was already happening before the pandemic, but certainly during the pandemic, we think about the amount of, uh, of, of, of deliveries that there were by, uh, you know, by delivery vans, then the, the number of miles, then also the greenhouse gas emissions associated with different modes of transport has, uh, has increased. And it's rather unfortunate that the, uh, the only sort of mass transportation that we have here in terms of buses uh, is the one which has seen uh, a decrease in, in usage over that time period. So, so how do we go about reducing the carbon emissions of transport? Well, I'd be the first person to say that, you know, we obviously need to end up, uh, we need to start off by looking at um, potentially engaging with, uh, with active transport and uh, walking and cycling. Um, uh, obviously, there's a big push um, in, in, you know, after the, the impacts of the pandemic to, uh, to try and encourage people to, to move back towards the greater use of, uh, of public transportation. Um, we can try and generate more efficient engines, but you know that's a fairly uh, mature technology, so probably only marginal gains in that respect. Um, or we could start to look at things like the use of, uh, of, of, of low carbon fuels and, and possibly things like biofuels, for example. Um, but the thing I want to kind of focus on here is the, uh, the, the potential value of, uh, of electrifying transport. And in particular, something I'll touch on at the end is the the benefits associated with combining that with an increased use of, uh, of renewable energy. And of course, it's, th it's this switch to the electrification of transport, which has become a, a central plank of policy in the UK um, and many other countries. Uh, and, and pretty much all of the countries in Europe, I think, now have uh, various different dates in which they uh, plan to, uh, to see the phasing out 
uh, of combustion engine cars. And of course, that's something which, uh, which, which attracted uh, probably the majority of the attention um, when the 10 point plan uh, was published in, in November 2020. So what about EVs as a, as a potential um, solution? Um, I think it's worthwhile bearing in mind that we can end up thinking, you know, certainly myself in terms of looking at electric vehicles as being a sort of like a, a high tech modern day um, form of transportation. But of course, electric vehicles um, are, are, are certainly nothing new. Um, and, you know, I certainly remember as a, as a kid and you still see some of these uh, these milk floats uh, trundling around uh, the, uh, the, the, the streets in, in, in Stoke. Um, you know, we're, we're very familiar with having seen uh, fully full battery electric vehicles uh, on our roads for, you know, for several decades. And, and if we look at the, uh, the history of electric vehicles, then um, Robert Anderson invented the first electric carriage in Scotland in 1830. Uh, we had the sale of commercial EVs in Belgium in 1890. Uh, in 1900, 38% of the cars that were sold in the US were electric, and that was greater than the 22% that were combustion engine cars. I think in 1899, 90% 90, 90 of the taxis in New York City were electric. Um, then it obviously went, you know, the, the, there was, the, there was the, the competing technologies of electric vehicles and combustion engines. Combustion engines, you know, clearly won, won they, they won out uh, in that initial competition. And it wasn't until, say, the late 90, you know, after the Second World War, when there started to be a reappearance of electric vehicles and the Enfield 8000 uh, produced in, I think, the Isle of Wight, with a less acid battery, was one of the, um, the first vehicles to, uh, to reappear. Then, of course, the big development technology wise was the development of lithium ion batteries in the 1980s. Um, then we had the launch of the, uh, the Toyota Prius, uh, which was the first uh, electric vehicle which had uh, a battery as part of the drivetrain. So the, uh, the emergence of, uh, of hybrid uh, electric vehicles. And then the, in 2008, we have the launch of the, the first Tesla vehicle, the Tesla Roadster. And we're all now familiar with um, just what a significant player. Uh, this, uh, this, this company has now become. Um, just to, um, a couple of text heavy slides, I know, but it's worthwhile talking, what, what am I talking about in terms of electric vehicles? There are, there are numerous different types of electric vehicles. I've also, I've already referred to hybrids and those were, you know, those are the, 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 the ones that have been, you know, we've been conscious of, you know, certainly in terms of this more recent era uh, that have been around for some time. So that's where you're combining an internal combustion engine uh, with an electric drivetrain and a battery. Uh, and this primary, this enables you to recoup uh, the energy uh, when you're decelerating uh, through regenerative braking uh, to, uh, to charge uh, the battery uh, and to, uh, to add that efficiency. Um, you then have uh, plug-in hybrid electric vehicles. This is where they have a slightly larger battery. They still have a combustion engine, but they've got a slightly larger battery and you can charge it by actually plugging it in to uh, an electricity supply. And so those can run solely on electric motor for anywhere between 15 and 50 miles. Um, we've then got the full battery electric vehicle, uh, which is where you completely dispense with a combustion engine and you've simply got a battery pack and electric motor. And you typically got, got a range of somewhere between 100 and 300 miles. And then you've got fuel cell uh, electric vehicles. Uh, so this is where you've got hydrogen fuel cells, but they are still electric vehicles. They still have batteries and they still have motors. Uh, so this is where you're using hydrogen as a fuel uh, and uh, running that through a, a fuel cell to generate the electricity, which charges a battery, uh, which drives the vehicle. And so offers the prospect of more rapid refueling and, and longer ranges, but potentially a much lower efficiency uh, than battery electric vehicles. Um, so um, you'll also see mention of plug-in electric vehicles. And so that would be the, the PHEVs and the, and the battery electric vehicles. Uh, but it's only the battery electric vehicles and the fuel cell electric vehicles which have zero tailpipe emissions because they don't have a combustion engine. Um, but if we end up looking at the, um, the, the development of battery electric vehicles in particular, which is what I'll be focusing on, then I, I think we're in quite exciting times at the moment in terms of we're seeing this, this, this sudden dramatic increase uh, in the number of, uh, of registrations of, uh, of battery electric vehicles and their, their market share um, in Europe. And if we look at um, December um, at the end of last year, then um, the most popular selling car period in, in Europe was the, was the Tesla Model 3. 
So the top seller on all the charts um, was a uh, was a full uh, battery electric vehicle. And if you look at some other markets in terms of, uh, of, 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 uh, of electric vehicles, this is looking at plug in hybrid electric vehicles and battery electric vehicles. But 90 percent of the cars sold in Norway, for example, uh, were, were plug in uh, electric vehicles and, uh, and almost two thirds in the Netherlands. So there's been this dramatic um, you know, transition already towards uh, towards EVs and um, organized finance uh, organizations like Bloomberg think that we're just at the start of this uptick where we'll see this continued uh, rapid increase in the use of battery electric vehicles over the coming years. Um, just to mention at this stage, some sort of common questions that, um, that are often asked uh, in terms of can they do long journeys? Um, and I'd say, you know, absolutely. Um, I've driven the length, I've done about almost 60,000 miles so far and driven the length of breadth of Britain. I was in sort of Shetland in September on a sea kayaking trip. Um, but, you know, you do have to do um, some planning to figure out where you're going to, uh, to, to stop. And there is obviously the time associated with that charging. That's something that we'll come back to a little bit later on. But, you know, there are, um, you know, increasing amounts of sort of charging infrastructure on at least the major um, highways. That means you can genuinely do longer journeys, not just short commutes. Um, will the battery degrade? Um, you know, it has been an issue on some um, early battery electric vehicles, but you know, you see things like um, there's this uh, this 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 story of uh, of, a, of a taxi firm down in Cornwall, um, which uh, ran their Nissan. You know, obviously taxi drivers rack up pretty significant um, miles, uh, and they racked up 175,000 miles or so uh, with their with their Nissan Leaf, and then was then that was handed on to uh, to to another. Um, user and we're still perfectly usable. Um, and if we look at the premium end of the spectrum and look at battery degradation in some of the, uh, the, the, the posher Teslas, um, then there are, I think there's a sort of like a Tesla uh, Model S that's been run um, in the US that's already done over um, half a million um, uh, kilometers. So batteries, it seems, are turning out to be, um, uh, to have a rather greater longevity than even the, the, the designers originally uh, anticipated. Um, there all, are also sort of common concerns in terms of, well, if we transition all to, uh, to electric vehicles, will that collapse the, uh, the natural grid, uh, national grid as a result of that, that draw? Um, but um, I think it's worthwhile reflecting that if we think about the fuels that we use already um, in terms of, uh, of petrol and diesel, then um, oil and gas extraction and, uh, and the refining of petroleum products are already uh, some of the most uh, energy intensive uh, industries that we have. Uh, in, uh, in industrialized nations. And so as we transition um, towards electric vehicles and away from combustion engine vehicles, there'll be a reduction in the energy that's required for, 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 those, uh, for those energy intensive uh, industries. And, and I think it's interesting that, you know, rather than being um, overly concerned about it, and that's not to say that there aren't problems, particularly within rural areas where uh, you know, grid supplies are more of a challenge, that the national grid are, you know, are very supportive um, of that transition to, uh, to, to, to electric vehicles. So, so what about some of the benefits before we look at the, uh, the, 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 the challenges? Um, well, if we end up looking at the carbon emissions related to an electric vehicle, then they start off with quite a significant penalty. Um, this gap is looking at the, uh, the, the life, life cycle emissions of an electric, uh, uh, well, of a combustion engine vehicle compared to an electric vehicle. Uh, and if we look at the, you know, the the uh, the the grey line is is the combustion engine vehicle of different times. The uh, the blue line is the electric vehicle, with A being a mini car, C a, uh, a medium car, D a large car, and F a luxury car. If we looked at the mini car, for example, then the mini car with the combustion engine um, starts off with a much lower carbon footprint than the uh, the 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 mini car with a with a big battery in it, because you've got a significant embedded carbon. Uh, within the uh, within the within the battery, but then if you look over the use phase, it's during that use phase um, when the carbon emissions are are generally uh, much lower. This this is a as a paper that was done on the basis of an average um, carbon intensity for the grid within Europe, and you can see that you reach this sort of break even according to uh, to, to this um, this paper at about seventy thousand um, kilometers, and then you start to yield. A, um, you know, a, 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 a tangible benefit uh, to driving the electric vehicle. So that's related to the reduced carbon intensity of the fuel uh, you're using to operate uh, the vehicle. 
Um, and of course, seeing as you're running it on electricity, then the the benefits or or otherwise are dependent on the 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 carbon intensity of the of, le- of the electricity that you're using to charge your vehicle. If you were on a very uh, carbon intensive grid that was run almost exclusively by, by coal, there will be very little benefit, uh, if any. Um, but if you're looking at running a battery electric vehicle um, of entirely renewable energy, or in particular, if you were then using that renewable energy to actually um, to provide the energy for the production of the vehicle and the battery, uh, that's where you could then start to, uh, to generate by far the largest um, carbon reductions. We'll come back to that a little bit later on. Um, for anyone who, like me, is becoming, I've become sort of increasingly interested in um, in, in carbon literacy and carbon footprints. Um, you might people might know of the work by Mike Berners Lee uh, and his book How How Bad Are Bananas. So his estimations of the carbon footprint of travel. So this would be uh, this is related to a return trip from London to Glasgow. And you can see here the estimated um, full life cycle carbon emissions related to those different types of uh, transport. We're probably unlikely to do it by bike, but if we look 40 kilograms of carbon dioxide equivalent, so that's including the emissions of things like uh, of methane as well as carbon dioxide, uh, the, 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 um, the, the, the range of different greenhouse gases, 64 kilograms by train, uh, 148 kilograms for a small battery electric vehicle, 237 for an efficient combustion engine car, 368 kilograms for a plane, and about a ton for one person driving a large, thirsty SUV on that journey. So you can see that certainly if you had a number of people crammed into a small battery electric vehicle, you've got something which is maybe you know, equivalent by his figures uh, to, uh, to, to, to those other mass transportation options. Um, in terms of um, the, the financial benefits as well, um, in thinking about the, uh, the, 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 the co-benefits of that transition, then, then that's something which has, I guess, become um, very much something that people become conscious of in a situation where we, 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 we see the escalation in, uh, in, the, in, the, in the cost of, uh, of petrol and diesel. Um, so if we look at a back of the envelope calculation, but I do about 20,000 miles uh, a year driving back and forth between uh, Stoke and, uh, and Cumbria. Then I used to have a, a, a Skoda Fabia, so hardly a, a hot hatch. Um, and with a, an economy of about 45 miles per gallon, I was using about 2,000 litres of fuel a year uh, at a cost now of £1.69 per litre. That would cost me just shy of £3,500 uh, a year. Um, and according to the UK government's own greenhouse gas conversion factors, that would be related to the emission of just over five tonnes of carbon. Um, with my current EV, um, with my average efficiency, I do just shy of four miles per kilowatt hour of electricity I put in the car. That's about just shy of 5,500 kilowatt hours. Uh, and if I can charge the car up overnight at 5p per kilowatt, uh, per kilowatt hour, um, then that's a total cost of, uh, of about 270 pounds. So, uh, you know, a very significant cost saving uh, in terms of the, uh, the, the fueling of the vehicle. And, and again, the government's own figures would suggest a, a carbon saving of the order of uh, four tonnes a year. And that's before you think about things like servicing uh, maintenance costs and, uh, and road tax, which, of course, is currently zero. But, you know, no technology um, is, is, is a panacea. And there are significant ongoing challenges related to uh, a transition uh, to, to battery electric um, vehicles, which I'd just like to, you know, to, 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 to explore. I mean, the environmental impacts are obviously um, the, the, the ones maybe to kind of start off with, you know, the production of any vehicles, uh, but particularly, you know, battery electric vehicles, you know, they are it, it's resource, resource intensive and, uh, and energy intensive. If we end up thinking about the range of raw materials that go into their um, production. So if we look at a, you know, a, 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 an average uh, electric vehicle, then you know, a significant amount of copper that's used within the wiring looms you know, of the order of 80 kilograms. Uh, the battery itself is, 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 contains significant amounts of lithium. Um, we've got cobalt, uh, nickel, and, and, and graphite, which are used in the, uh, in the, in the battery. Um, and we've got a variety of different rare earth elements which are used in the, uh, in the electromagnets in the, in, in the motors. Um, and of course, a, a lot of focus has been, and there's been a lot of concern voiced about, um, about cobalt as being described as a dirty secret of electric vehicles and concern about 
working conditions and the uh, you know artisanal miners in the Democratic Republic of Congo um, in particular. Um, although it is worth bearing in mind that we've already we're already seeing the the appearance of, of different battery chemistries. Uh, I'm, I'm not a chemist by background, but I think it's a sort of a fascinating you know area. We we see the the launch of cobalt free batteries, um, lithium ion phosphate batteries. Uh, which are already coming to market. And I was just reading something the other day that, um, you know, with the potential now to move away from lithium ion batteries to sodium ion batteries, with sodium being a much more um, readily available uh, element on earth than, than lithium. Um, and hopefully, whilst it's rather difficult to recycle petrol and diesel, then once we've got the, uh, the batteries into the supply chain, then there is that opportunity to end up having a circular economy. Uh, then rather the big tragedy would be for, for the, you know, for the batteries or any of the components to end up in landfill. And there is that proper, there is that opportunity to, uh, to, you know, to, to recycle um, all of the resources, all of those, uh, those metals uh, and the elements which are incorporated into that um, within, um, within a, a circular uh, economy. Um, there's also, of course, the ability to, once a battery has outlived its useful life within the car, then there are um, so-called second life usages. Uh, it could be, it could go into uh, a domestic property, for example, to, to provide, um, you know, to provide uh, battery storage within a, within a household or used in combination with other retired batteries to provide, um, um, you know, grid uh, support services as well. So, a really rapidly uh, developing market for the use of, uh, of, of secondhand uh, EV batteries. And, and of course, we can end up uh, recycling uh, all of those uh, constituent parts and some really interesting work going, for, going on, for example, in, in Birmingham University, uh, looking into, uh, in, into the, 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 the processes uh, involved in that. Um, other issues, of course, to bear in mind in, in terms of the environmental impacts, it's not, it's not true to say that battery electric vehicles are zero emissions. They still produce emissions. They don't produce tailpipe emissions, but you've got the, the issue of tire wear and the production of those microplastics. Uh, so that is something that other people are, you know, are, are looking into. And, and another way, you know, another aspect of, uh, of vehicle pollution, uh, which is still to be um, addressed. Um, the, the second, second thing, which I think is, a, is an issue as well, are the, 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 the potential barriers to mass adoption. You know, for this to kind of work, we need to see mass adoption um, of battery electric vehicles to try and um, decarbonize our transport. And the, the, the Committee on Climate Change has been critical of the government on this, a number of situations saying that this is, this is proceeding uh, too slowly if we want to reach uh, our, our, our goals in terms of, uh, of, of net zero by, by 2050. Um, and, I, and I think probably in that respect, one of the greatest um, kind of concerns or barriers to mass adoption uh, probably relates to concerns uh, um, regarding the, the charging infrastructure in the UK. Um, you know, we're, we're clearly going to witness this, uh, this, this rolling out of the infrastructure uh, over the country to enable people to make longer journeys in, uh, in EVs. Um, and and, and uh, um, more of the kind of the provision of the services that you can kind of see here in this case in, in, in Scotland. Um, so, you know, if we're charging EVs, then um, there's typically you'll find, and maybe there's some owners in the uh, in the audience uh, this evening that you'll 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 spend most of your time using what are known as destination charges, because of course, you know, cars spend most of their time, you know, unless you're a, a taxi driver or something else, you know, stationary. So whilst it's stationary, if there's the opportunity to plug them in either at home or at work, uh, then that provides an ideal opportunity to uh, to, to put that electrical energy in. Of course, that immediately reserve, you know, raises concerns. Well, that's all very well if you've got off-street parking, but if you haven't got that, then you know, clearly that's more problematic. Um, and so there are some developments now in terms of on-street charging facilities, for example, by, by repurposing existing uh, street infrastructure like uh, like lampposts. But I think you know that's pretty uh, few and far between, and a lot of those developments seem to be. Um, within you know London and the and the southeast, but some interesting developments, but still at a pretty early stage. Um, and certainly in terms of if we're looking at making the uh, these these longer journeys, um, then it's these rapid charges which would become um, critical uh, for, for for those longer term journeys. Also, the kind of things that would be used for things like you know taxi drivers and, and others who are making 
you know, um, longer doing the longer uh, travel distances during the course of the uh, the day. And there are really positive developments in that respect. If we if we start positive, the development of big charging hubs and so-called electric forecourts that are opening up around the country. This was the first one of that um, um, sort of style that was opened in Essex um, in, well, I say last December, that was actually December 2020. That's got 36 high powered charging stalls. Uh, it's got a, a nice place to go and get your cup of coffee and go shopping. Uh, but you'll notice here that it's also associated with renewable energy generation, both on site uh, and also off site. And I'll, I'll come back to that um, at the end of the end of the talk. Um, but if we end up looking at the distribution of these kinds of charges, um, then this is some work I did with some colleagues at Kiel, uh, and we looked at the distribution of these rapid charges, and then we looked at the distribution of situations where there are two rapid charges, what we described as multiplicity. So you're thinking, well, I'll go there, and there's two charges, so if one's out of order or, or one is occupied already, then I know I'll be able to get a charge on another one. And then this is showing, the, the right-hand one is showing where you've got four or more stalls, and you can see that you don't need to go very far before you can see some big blanks on the map. Um, so, you know, the, th there's clearly a need to have a more extensive uh, and, and, and geographically extensive uh, of, of infrastructure uh, to provide that, uh, that mobility uh, that's required for everyone to make that transition. And something that we're looking at, um, you know, at Kiel with my sort of colleagues is that you know, good, you know, great developments within urban areas and along the strategic road network. But if you look at areas of the uh, of the country, we looked at sort of different grid squares, which lack any sort of multiplicity. So multiples of charges, you can see how places like Wales, for example, large parts of mid Wales in particular, uh, lack much in the way of current provision. And there's already um, sort of coverage and anecdotal concerns that of, of EV drivers of having to avoid particular parts of the country. Uh, because of concerns about the absence of that charging infrastructure. Um, if you then um, add into that the complexity of different charge points being run by different charge point providers, then you have to have different apps and potentially different cards, then whilst that's something which is improving, that's still something which is, uh, is, is not particularly helpful when you're trying to access those charges and, and, uh, and, and to, uh, to, 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 uh, to be able to kind of charge your, your vehicle. Um, and the final thing, which is uh, which is which which is a sort of like a cause from concern from from my perspective, is is that sort of sense of you know it's really important that we have a just transition to you know to these new technologies. And I'm I'm sort of struck now that if I was to buy a an equivalent car to the one I bought three years ago, now it'd probably cost me more now than it did when I bought it due to the the cost of the car increasing and also a reduction in the uh, in the government grant. So that concerns about just the accessibility uh, of those vehicles to purchase if people want to and to leverage those benefits. And also that slight concern that when I first got the vehicle and, uh, and you're able to benefit from free charging, I was thinking, well, you know, I'm, 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 I'm lucky enough to have the capital to be able to buy one of these. And I'm then in a situation where I'm able to kind of charge it up in some journeys for, for, for nothing. Is that, is that really just and fair? Well, you know, probably not. Um, so hopefully there are some really in, you know, useful developments in that sense. It, it, it's clearly not going to deal with any of the problems related to, uh, to, you know, to, to congestion in particular, for example, if we all made a straight swap towards EVs. So the potential for the development of, uh, of, of EV car sharing schemes, and, and, and I'm particularly interested in the development of, uh, of community EV car sharing clubs, uh, which to start to see um, occurring within a variety of areas in the country, um, and uh, there was this interesting one that started up within uh, in, in, the, in Gateshead near Newcastle uh, upon Tyne. So those have the potential to provide low and fair access to EVs for, for, for all sectors of, uh, of our communities. Um, and also interesting concerns about the safety and the accessibility of, uh, of, of EVs as well. So doing some work with uh, looking at the experiences of the public charging infrastructure of um, of uh, of uh, 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 the, the, the experiences of the of the public charging infrastructure from female users, for example. Um, and, you know, uh, Maddie Moat, who's involved with sort of fully, fully charged and uh, another uh, is, is a, a well-known sort of science communicator, um, you know, posted this uh, uh, in 2020 saying and pondering why she felt so stressed about struggling to find an EV charger last night, uh, had to go and charge. 
um, and then had to go to a charger in a in a darkened car park past 10 o'clock and was sat alone in a, in a in a car connected to the charger and so kind of concerns about sort of personal safety in that situation and also emerging issues at the moment in terms of there are there are aspects of the charging infrastructure which are just completely inaccessible uh, to uh, to you know to disabled uh, drivers. So these emerging issues that I think feed into this into this this concern. But just to uh, to start to draw things to a, to a close and to, to try and finish on a on a on a on a on a more positive note, I think there are some really exciting um, future prospects for the electrification of transport uh, longer term. I think we're going to end up seeing an increasing electrification of different types of transport. You know, so far it's focused on, you know, passenger vehicles. Uh, but in spite of the fact that people said, oh, well, that'll never work for, you know, for large trucks, then we're seeing companies like Volvo that already uh, are, offer a whole selection of, uh, of heavy good vehicles that are full battery electric, uh, you know, that, that, that are full battery electric trucks um, based entirely around, uh, you know, around batteries and trucks, you can obviously put much larger batteries uh, within those. So those developments and, uh, are already taking place. We're seeing things like the electrification of other forms of transport, like, uh, like ferries. So I, I, I had the, I was lucky enough to kind of go on this, this ferry in, in Norway. Uh, a couple of years ago before lockdown. Um, and uh, this is the, the world's first battery powered car ferry, um, only doing a relatively short hop across a, um, a fjord. Um, but that, um, that was used as part of a trial uh, and it reduced the, uh, the ferry company's uh, uh, carbon emissions by 95% and it reduced its, uh, its fuel costs by 80%. Uh, so that was seen as a, as a roaring success. Um, and we're even seeing the uh, the, the electrification of, uh, of, of of flight, uh, you know, admitted, you know, for short flights in particular, but the kind of things which could be uh, useful for, for small inter island um, travel. Um, and we can think about they're already looking at that um, for inter island travel in, you know, to and from and between the islands on Orkney as an example. Uh, but it's when we connect uh, battery electric vehicles to uh, to, 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 to smart uh, energy systems, which I think is where things become particularly um, interesting. And so we're moving to a situation now where as we electrify transport, you know, we, we have the potential to kind of connect them to, uh, to, to, to the electrical systems that we have uh, in society more generally. Uh, and so we've got this quotation here that the future transport system will be more integrated with smart buildings uh, the electric grid, uh, renewables and information ecosystems, allowing for, for great ex opportunities to exploit these interconnections, something that we didn't have that opportunity to do when uh, the transportation was based around uh, liquid fuels. So all kinds of issues there, for example, related to, uh, to, to the ability to make use of time of use tariffs. So if you are lucky enough to, uh, to be able to plug in at home, um, then we're already in a situation where there's that ability to, uh, to access cheaper energy overnight when the, uh, the supply is there, but the demand is reduced. Uh, so that has the opportunity to, uh, to, you know, to charge your car up uh, over those, uh, those, those cheaper hours. So you can see this is a tariff I'm on at home. Uh, I've got four, four hours of 5p a kilowatt hour. So that'll be the time in particular in winter when I'm um, focusing on charging the car. And, and from a carbon emissions point of view, then it's those, uh, those, those hours overnight that are not just cheaper, uh, they're also cleaner. They're associated with a reduced carbon intensity. So driving the demand of that charging to times when we already have a, an, an abundance of energy um, is, uh, is, is, is gonna be increasingly important. Um, and, and obviously as, as, the, um, as we're connecting electric vehicles to the electricity grid and that electricity grid is decarbonizing over time, uh, then that means that the carbon emissions associated with the battery electric vehicle will reduce over time if we're able to continue to, uh, to decarbonize the, uh, the grid more generally at the rate that's required. Uh, and of course, if we end up then using more in the way of clean energy to, uh, to for example, to, uh, to, 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 to create our batteries, um, then that has the potential to, uh, to reduce that embedded carbon that we have within the batteries that are a big penalty. Uh, within battery electric vehicles to uh, to start off with. Um, but I think something which is interesting from a domestic point of view and something which I did early last year was to uh, was to have solar PV installed at home and suddenly that realization that now you can actually generate your own electricity 
and decide what you want to do with that. And one of the things that you can do within that electrical energy um, is to stick that into the car. So here's the array we had in kind of stalled up in home in, uh, in, in Penrith in January last year. Um, and uh, of course, one of the things that you can do with that energy, you can see here is to divert that electrical energy into your electric, um, in, into an electric vehicle. Um, and so uh, last year was the first year of operation in that respect. And um, I was able to put about um, just over 800 kilowatt hours of surplus solar energy into the car, uh, which equates to about 3000 miles of motoring, uh, which, was, uh, which was generated just by those 12 uh, solar panels on the, on the roof. Um, and, it, and, it, and it's a research looking at the, uh, the broader environmental impacts of, uh, of different forms of transportation that suggests that, as it says here from this quote from an environmental footprint perspective, uh, solar powered battery electric vehicles are the most resource efficient per unit distance. So it's combining uh, battery electric vehicles um, with uh, this, uh, you know, with renewable energy, in particular things like, you know, local or community based uh, renewable energy. Uh, which is where we can we can leverage some of the most significant environmental benefits. Um, finally, I, I think you know we've seen this growth of um, of renewables, but at the same time, tragically, we're seeing an increasing in amount increase in the number of times in which we're actually having to curtail those assets because we can't um, use that um, that energy, um, and so. Rather than seeing them as a problem, then um, if we think about all of those cars, um, which are potentially spending a lot of time sat there plugged in, but with, which aren't really, um, you know, which are not being used for travel at that stage, then there's a huge amount of, uh, of battery storage that can be used uh, to provide support to, uh, to, to the grid or maybe to your home. So I think something to look out for and something which we're on the verge of, there's been some trials, but it's not been out, um, used at mass, is, is the idea of vehicle to grid. That when everyone gets home and, and plugs in their kettle, you know, rather than firing up a whole series of gas peaker plants, you could just end up withdrawing some of that energy out of the battery electric vehicles that have all been plugged in once people get home. Um, and you could then revert to charging them overnight when the general demand um, is, is, more, is more limited. And, and there's a number of you know, um, interesting think pieces on things like the conversation that said, well, you know, maybe this is a solution as we move towards more and more in the way of renewable energy generation, and we have a concomitant increase for uh, a need for more in the way of energy storage, then the, the increase in the, uh, the use and the ownership of electric vehicles could be, uh, could be uh, part of that, that solution. Um, and just sort of finally, then I know that we've experienced some pretty significant um, weather conditions in, uh, in the form of Storm Munis um, in, uh, in, in February, major concerns related to the stability of the grid and power outages. Um, and so the potential as well that, you know, if you've got a battery electric <coughs> vehicle on the drive, then you could literally run your house for a week off that car. So the ability to use those in order to provide more in the way of resilience uh, and, and, and the potential to ride through power outages um, could again be another benefit of that, of that transition. Um, so just to conclude, then um, one of the key problems that we face at the moment is that road transportation is, is and in particular is one of the key sources of greenhouse gas emissions, uh, both in the UK uh, and globally. And, and the attempts to reduce the greenhouse gas emissions related to transport, certainly road transport, have had limited impact um, so far. So that's flatlined. So that's generated a lot of interest in, in the electrification of, uh, of vehicles and of transportation in general, particularly when combined with renewable energy as, uh, as having the potential to deliver uh, significant environmental benefits. Um, but there are uh, significant ongoing challenges related to the battery manufacture, the, the, uh, the, the resource use that's required for that, um, issues with charging infrastructure, tire emission, emissions and the inaccessibility of, of those vehicles uh, to many, uh, which, which need to be uh, you know, considered and resolved. Uh, but at the same time, some exciting prospects as we look towards moving towards more smart energy networks and hopefully the development of a more sustainable uh, and, a, and a circular uh, economy. Um, you know, rather than kind of flag up, and there are some sort of papers that I'll have kind of like alluded to, um, there are some things like Fully Charged Show, which have got some really um, great stuff related to, uh, to electric vehicles and, and smart uh, home technologies in, in, in general. And, uh, and for those of you who are interested more, are kind of conscious as a sort of like a sidebar event, 
you know, if you want to look at more of the uh, of the technical details related to uh, to, to EVs, then uh, a, a YouTube channel which I'd thoroughly recommend is one run by uh, uh, Ewan McTurk, who's uh, an electrochemist, uh, who's produced uh, this this Plug Life Television um, channel, which has got some really um, useful and, and far more detailed uh, resources uh, on that. Um, so I'll just say um, thank you very much for for listening. I'll. I'll try my best to address any questions that emerge at the end, and uh, I hope there's been some stuff in there of, uh, of, of interest.